up there, Stephanie. Welcome everyone. Happy birthday, Stephanie. Hope you're all having a great weekend. Uh, my name is Baron Collins Hill. Hope you all are well. Welcome to Mando Lessons Live, happening most Saturdays at 1 p.m. Eastern. Let's see, let us know if you're, this is your first time in the chat. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces already, but it's always great to hear from folks who are just tuning in for the first time. And maybe where you're coming from, if you feel like that, but no pressure there. We've got British Columbia and New Jersey, Philadelphia, Georgia, Belfast, Ireland, Evansville, Indiana. Sounds like a nice 70 degree day. That sounds great. It's going to be mid 60s here in Oregon. Hopefully that'll be a, a nice time to get out. And we got Ireland, uh, London, UK. William is working on Walls for Two Friends. I wish I could remember how that goes. It's not like I wrote it or anything. And Shady Grove, also good. Also, East Tennessee Blues, great tune. Yeah, let us know what tunes you're working on or what songs you're working on in the chat. Love hearing what everybody's working on. <laughs> working on, working on, working on. Uh, to London, Washington, Curlew, Washington. That's a great town name. There's a tune called The Noisy Curlew. Can't remember how it goes right now. It's a great Irish tune. Michigan, Denise, good to have you here. Not quite front por front porch weather. Yeah, I think Lewis may have lucked out on that one. Riverside, California, Dan, good to have you as always. Fullerton, California, home place of Fender musical instruments. Great to have you again, Thomas. Ryan in Ottawa, Plymouth, Mass. Chris Thiele. <laughs> Wait, Chris Thiele. That's not a place. You and Chris Thiele should have a jam. I would love to have a jam with Chris Thiele. If anybody knows how to get him on the live stream, I'm in. Uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, I heard you guys had quite the storm. Hope you're safe. Um, you guys have been really getting uh, getting it. Uh, lots of wild weather, so best wishes to all you in Nashville. Marietta, Georgia. Romeo, Michigan. Ooh, all right. James just put down a deposit on a mandolin from J.J. Ryan in Scotland. Definitely keep us posted on that. Always fun to think about new instruments. What is the mandolin? This is a 10-string mandola mandolin, so it's got too many strings, and it's tuned C, G, D, A, E. So mandolin, mandola, mandola, mandolin, it's long scale, so I kind of think of it as a 10 string mandola, 16 inch scale length like your average mandola. Um, and it's built by Lawrence Smart in Idaho. Um, I picked this up a little while ago from the great folks at the Music Emporium. 
and I've really been enjoying it. It's fun to get a lot of those tunes that I love to play down in the lower octave. All right, Stephanie's working on Blarney Pilgrim. That's a great tune. I wish I could remember how that goes off the top of my head. Blarney Pilgrim. I'll try to play that later. It's a great one. Marion's still working on tremolo. That is definitely a lifelong project to get that nice smooth sound. I am also working on that myself. All right, Blue Sky from Turkey. Good to have you here. Edward from California. Spain, excellent. All over the world. That's what I like to see. Awesome. William just found out about John Reichman and the harmonic tone revelers. Yeah, I love John Reichman. He's one of the best. Can you play Blarney Pilgrim? I, I, I can if I can remember how it goes. I have to think about, there's a great, one of my favorite albums of all time is Andy Irvin, Irvine and Paul Brady. My main accent sneaking in there, Irvin. Uh, Andy Irvine and Paul Brady. Um, just a duo album, self-titled. It's the blue one with both of them on the cover. One of the best albums of all time. And they do a, a song called The Jolly Soldier. And then they go into the Blarney Pilgrim. And so I always need to think about the song to get the tune. But the tune, a great request from Stephanie, goes like this. Pilgrim. I think I was playing it in the wrong key though. That's the trick with the old 10 string. I think I was playing it in G instead of D. But uh. My bad. Alright, so let's see. So yeah, the way these work, if you're new here, uh, it's mostly about mandolin. So ask questions or music in general, I should say. Uh, any questions about the mandolin, happy to answer them to the best of my ability. Music in general, love hearing what people are working on. Happy to take requests, especially if they're uh, fiddle tunes that I know and are in the public domain, so there's no copyright issues. Um, so Blarney Pilgrim's right up there, that's great, one of my favorite tunes. It also looks like Lewis. Blarney is the go-to warm-up tune. That's a good one. I should play it more. I don't play that one as much. And definitely check out Andy Irvine and Paul Brady if you haven't already because they're the best. Anyone suggest some reading material about the history of American traditional music? That's a great question, William. 
I'm not going to be able to come up with anything off the top of my head, but hopefully people here in the chat can help you out. I've definitely, I read a lot in college, but that was 10 years ago. So it's uh, not, not right with me like it used to be, but there's a lot of great stuff out there, especially about old time and bluegrass and stuff like that. All right, let's see. It's true. <laughs> Rainbow Connection. Wish I could do that. Awesome. Uh, awesome. You were keeping up with the... That was kind of ripping. I didn't mean to start it that fast. Do I play any tracks from movies? No, that's stuff that's all copyright and gets me in trouble with the YouTube police. So I only do traditional music. <laughs> Ray was here. Says, noticed you're missing the beard. Yep, every once in a while I wake up and it's just gone off to some other some other chin and has left me all cold and alone so no beard today but it'll probably be back by next week <laughs> the air tune that's a great tune i can't remember how that one goes but i know it's by oh come on uh liz carroll a great tune called the air tune definitely check that one out that one used to got, get played a lot it's probably still will once the sessions start back up in my Belfast, Maine session, that tune always makes me think about playing with my friends up there. I just can't remember how it goes. That's one of the ones that I always just kind of follow. So what are people working on? Uh, happy to answer any questions people have. There was a little talk of tremolo. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about that. But whatever questions you have, uh, throw them out there. And I'm happy to uh, answer the, to the best of my ability. So tremolo. The main thing about tremolo, stay nice and relaxed. You know, once you're tensed up, whether it's in your shoulders or your back or your neck, whatever it is. Oh, La Bas Strang, I'll definitely play that as well. Um, nice and relaxed all the way down your arms. You know, start out with good technique like I teach in the very first lesson in the beginner series. Start out nice and slow. You know, whatever speed you can kind of get your right hand moving at. Just nice and relaxed. And then speed up a little bit. And as soon as you start feeling like a little bit of tension, just don't go any faster than that and see if you can get the tension out of your fingers at that speed. And then speed up a little bit. And then relax and it's just kind of a nice little kind of wave of speed up a little bit and then while you're at that speed relax and then you know do that as much as possible obviously there's gonna be a ceiling to that but don't you know don't push beyond that I'm happy to play catch jig in just a minute here um, And then work on it with, a, you know, like one, one string, you know, just like your D string. Or maybe try some double stops. Also work on kind of some dynamics of starting out quiet with a slower tremolo speed and then speeding up and kind of having this nice little swell in the middle so it sounds like this Tremolo is such a emotional uh, technique. It's really fun to really just kind of work on that and try to get a lot of feeling into it. All right, I'll catch up a little bit. I'll play a little, oh, cash jig. I can't remember cash jig. Uh, I'll try to remember cash jig. I can't remember it right off the top of my head. D's here from Washington State. Good to have you. Working on Wayfaring Stranger. Glad to hear it. Okay, uh, I missed some stuff up here. Let me catch up. I do not know any 
hymns in the public domain, unfortunately. Oh yeah, I'll play a lava string. That was a good request here. One of my favorite tunes of all time. dance tune one of my favorites uh all right let's see there's a question there's a good question in here have you uh oh have i done the star of monster i think so you can always use the search function on my website which is slowly getting some updates thanks to a friend um so it should be a little easier to use and filter through tunes pretty soon i'll let you know when that goes live but i'm working on some site upgrades at the moment make everything a little easier for everybody to to search through because there's a lot of there's so many lessons over there i can't remember what i've done and what i haven't i assume i've done the star of monster but i have no idea maybe somebody knows quicker than i do blue sky has a great question did you memorize the notes i did you know i think it's tricky it depends on the instrument that i'm playing i think you know, I've played mandolin, which was my first instrument for a long time. I've played it in a lot of different musical styles and contexts. So I studied jazz in college while playing man on the mandolin. And, um, you know, I've worked more on scales and kind of bass fundamental techniques on mandolin more than I have on guitar and banjo. So for the most part, I know what note I'm playing at any given time. Um, I spent a little bit of time, you know, just mapping out the fingerboard. A great exercise you can use is just like put your finger down and hit a note and be like, okay, what is that? Well, it's a D sharp or an E flat. Um, you just kind of work it out. Maybe you have to start from the open string. A, B, C sharp, D, D sharp or E flat. Um, or put one here. All right, what is that? That's going to be a C sharp. And then maybe find it in some other spots. You know, if you're way up the neck. See if you can find that C sharp on the D string, the same place on the A string, or a lower C sharp. Find a bunch of C sharps all over the instrument. It'll really help you figure out some nice patterns, like, oh, there's a C sharp here, or whatever note I'm on, I get take any given note, for this example, sixth fret on the G string is the same note just an octave lower as fourth fret on the a string so you have this little kind of two frets towards the nut and two sets of strings over and you have another c sharp so that's an octave higher or you can go just one set of strings over and five frets higher so one one two three four five and one string and you get another octave so finding all those octaves is really helpful. Um, or if you go four, three sets of strings over, you can go like from your G string to third fret on your E string. That's two octaves, but it's still uh, the same note. So kind of working through things like that can be really helpful just to get an understanding of what note you're playing at any given time. And I think it's a good skill to have. That said, you know, once I started picking up uh, six string guitar and banjo and things like that, I've mostly played those instruments kind of by muscle memory and using my ears. So I'm much slower at figuring out what note, and I haven't really practiced all that much, what note I'm playing at any given time. It would be a good thing to do. It's a little strange on banjo because you're always kind of changing tunings on banjo, at least in the kind of old time claw hammer style. Um, but that would be fun. I'm actually currently 
working on pedal steel back here, that crazy little table in the corner. And I've been playing that by ear for a couple of years, but I've really just kind of backed off and said, okay, I got to start over, get a lot of skills that I kind of breezed by. And it's, it's slow going. It's the slowest instrument I've ever tried to learn. It's just really finding it very, uh, uh, unconventional and, uh, unfamiliar I think and it's it's unlike you know I play mandolin so I pick up a guitar and I'm like yeah I kind of understand how this works and then I pick up a banjo and it's like oh right hand's a little different but I'm still using frets with my left hand but pedal steel is just a totally different animal and I'm really realizing that I need to know you know what note I'm on and what scale degree and then what the pedals do to change all those it's it's my current kind of obsession of the moment. And I think what I'm gonna do is just, I've been thinking about this for a couple of days, is just get a big, there's actually, there's a mandolin version of this too, but there's a like a pedal steel fretboard map that you can find. You can also look up like mandolin fretboard map. And it'll just tell you what every note is on every string and every fret. Um, and that can be helpful to just kind of get that under your, it's good to have it in your head, but it can be nice to have a visual representation to get used to it. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do with pedal steel, is get a big printout, you know, so I can sit at the instrument and also see it. Probably tape it up right behind the, the pedal steel over there. Uh, so yeah, that's, yeah, I think it's it's good to know the notes. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know the notes well enough to say like, oh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I do in particular keys. Like if I'm in D, I can just kind of rattle off. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G, F sharp, E, D, C sharp, A, B, A, <laughs> whoa, G, F sharp, E, D, got a little turned around there, but, you know, I can do that sort of thing, but that's not what I'm thinking when I'm playing music. I'm using muscle memory in my ears. But then if I were to, like, record myself doing that, then I could go back and figure it out. It's essentially the the process of transcribing, which is an important thing to do and something I should work on more. I'm a slow transcriber. Oh, who's playing with John? Oh yeah, Liz Carroll and John Doyle are amazing. What's some of my favorites? I get, was very lucky to teach at a, a camp with them every year for a couple years in a row and it was good times. They're both super nice folks. All right. Nine Pound Hammer, great tune. Make some more good stuff. Those little high frets you look useless. Yeah, I definitely don't use them. Um, they work. Um, I, I certainly don't go up that high with any regularity. But you listen to someone like Dave Apollon or Apollon. I don't know how to say his last name, but early mandolin player. Um, played kind of showy, kind of classical stuff, and he's up there all the time. He really makes that stuff sing and makes use of the whole fretboard. I think A-P-O-L-L-O-N, Dave Apollon, Apollon? I don't know how to say his last name. Never tried to say it out loud, but uh, check him out. He's a very amazing mandolin player, one of the early mandolin masters. How do you remember chord progressions? You have a much better memory for melody than chord progressions. I went through the same thing myself. You know, I think when I started out, I was just like, I'm gonna learn a bunch of melodies because that's what interests me. Um, and then I realized I knew a couple dozen tunes and didn't have any idea how to get the chord progressions under my fingers. I think uh, it's kind of a repetition thing. Just like, you know, you gotta, like if you're learning a tune from my website, you can, um, either try to pick up by ear through the play along tracks, what chords are happening, or you can look at the sheet music and working on things like that. Um, that can really help you, um, kind of, again, have a visual representation. Eventually, you know, with a lot of these three chord songs where there's not a million chords like there are in like a jazz standard, you'll start to hear like, oh, this is what should happen. You hear the chord coming. And I kind of got used to that just by going to bluegrass festivals, only knowing three chords. And I just wander around waiting to hear somebody playing in the key of G. And I'd be like, hey, I know that key. And then play in G and then they'd switch keys and I'd go look for somebody else playing in G. Um, but 
that is sort of my thought on chord progressions. And really, it's a lot of repetition, using your ears. I have some lessons on like how to hear the chord changes that can be very helpful. Um, just sort of to um, help you figure out by ear what's going on there. Do you use a round pick or a pointed pick for tremolo? Uh, I use a pointed pick. This is the pick that I use for everything on the most mandolins. It's a little bit, I, on old mandolins I use a different pick, but on kind of modern bluegrassy style, Gibson style mandolins, I use this Dunlop prime tone. It's 1.5 millimeters thick, big triangle, kind of medium pointiness. It's not like quite as pointy as you know, your average standard guitar pick, which is what I use on kind of old Gibson mandolins. Um, but these are the two picks that I use. I think, you know, rather than the... And then you see someone like David Grisman who uses a very rounded pick. I, I've never been able to get used to those, but um, it to certainly works for him. Um, but often it's not so much about the pointiness of the pick. It's just about how far into the string let me get this right in the camera where am i that's always hard all right so like how deep through the strings <laughs> i can't do this uh your pick is going so you know if you're way down here that's going to be a lot of drag and you're just going to get stuck and not make any sound so you want to stay right near the top of the string my fingers are not in the right place but just so you can see you know just brushing through the strings is going to be a lot easier than really trying to dig in a lot closer. Um, so that can be helpful and doesn't necessarily change the shape of your pick. That said, you know, experimenting with a couple different picks is a great and fairly inexpensive way to sort of see what you like the best, but it's personal preference. Thank you, Uncle Bobby, for the Super Chat donation. Really appreciate it. Helps me do these live streams. No matter how you support me, I really appreciate it. Um, there's a bunch of patrons in the chat. There's links in the description to make donations uh, via PayPal and Venmo and Patreon. You can also use the Super Chat. It's all the same to me. It's greatly appreciated, but not required. Thank you. A demo of Tremolo using a simple, familiar song. Great question. All right, so let's see. Um... Let's see, what's a nice, simple song? So something like uh, You Are My Sunshine, tried to play it night. It's actually a copyrighted song, but if I play it really slow, maybe the algorithm won't pick up on it. Hope it won't, but I can always fix that later. Um, so yeah, so, you know, take a familiar song that you already know. It's a great use to uh, kind of work on any, any musical skills, to take something you already know and try to apply that new technique or that new skill to it. Ryan is working on reprogramming the jig picking. Yep, that definitely takes some going, but it's a, a worthwhile effort. <laughs> nice. Yep, definitely, you know, he says bobbing his head helps. You know, whether it's bobbing your head or just kind of like getting your, your kind of shoulders into it, whatever it may be, or tapping your foot. That's all great information for your kind of playing to, as long as you're doing it uh, in time. 
<laughs> There's some amazing musicians who can play everything you could ever ask of them, but don't tap their foot in time, <laughs> which is just kind of, that becomes more of just kind of like a, uh, a habit or like a, it's, it's no longer kind of helping you stay on track. Um, you know, if you're, if you're tapping your foot out of time, that it's not necessarily bad, but it, it's, it, it's hard to say because a lot of that stuff is just so internal and so personal that maybe, maybe some people who tap their feet out of time, maybe it helps them somehow. Um, but hard to say, but yeah, definitely, you know, like get your whole body into playing the music for sure. As you can tell, I'd probably do it a little overboard. Um, I definitely tend to kind of have a bobblehead when I play. Drowsy Maggie, another great tune. I can't remember how it goes. Hey, Dave Appleton, right down the road. Jackie Coleman's. I can't remember how that tune goes either. I'll try to th try to think about that. Um, Jackie, I can. I, that one is not going to come into my head, but. If it does, I will certainly play it. <laughs> oh, I thought that was... Uh, uh, James, I thought you were making a, an inside joke on the Canadian tunes that isn't a total... Uh, James says, I'm yet to, I've yet to hear a Canadian tune which isn't a total joy, which I agree. At first I thought... There's a tune called Joys of Quebec, which is... Uh, how does that go? A very classic tune so <laughs> I, I didn't know if you were making like a joys of quebec pun <laughs> um like every tune you hear sounds like joys of quebec or the only canadian tune you hear is joys of quebec but i, I agree some of uh french canadian tunes there are some kind of minor kind of spooky ones but um not as many they a lot of them are very happy um and i, I, I love that music Uh, made behind the bar. All these uh, great Irish tunes. I can't remember how they go. Ryan, thank you so much for the super chat. And Edward, really appreciate it. Glad you all are enjoying. Whiskey Before Breakfast. That's a tune I can play. Starts with three G's on the D string. This is the sort of stuff. This is catch jig. This is it. That's not Kesh Jig, but it is a tune that starts with a bunch of G's and then an A B. That might be four G's though. What is Kesh Jig? It's hard because there's no rhythm to start with. Um, whiskey before breakfast. I'll play a little of that. So this is a little intro. I know people are generally interested in these. Just starting out with a little kind of introduction. And I'm playing it on the G and D strings. So it's G on the seventh fret and open D string. And do a little hammer on, then seven and open, I'm uh, sorry, six and open. And then four and open. And then back up to six and open. Gives it a little kind of set the mood. Seven. Thank you. 
shot it. <laughs> Got a little off the rails there at the end. Probably was making some faces there. My apologies. Um, oh, yeah, Robert Randolph. Whew, I love Robert Randolph. Speedboat Aquatics says, 10 string, what's the tuning? So this is, oops, sorry for hitting the mic. Uh, indeed, a 10 string instrument. It's just like a mandolin, G, D, A, E, except... It's got a low C string like a mandola, so C, G, D, A, E. All right. Glad you're enjoying the lessons, Mary. Thank you for the kind note. Oh, that's Jim Ward's. Ah, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was thinking about, probably I was thinking about Jim Ward's when somebody requested, uh, Jackie Coleman's. I get Jim Ward and Jackie Coleman's mixed up. Um, Fisher's Hornpipe. Oh, that's a good one. Trying to learn that one with the sheet music, but a demo would be great. Yeah. Um, Fisher's Hornpipe. A very noty tune. This is a great tune if you're working on getting your uh, pick direction in proper order. Uh, this is really... This is a good test of it because it's constant eighth notes. So pretty much your hand's going to be going down and up the whole time in eighth notes, but there's also a lot of string crossing. So keep your eye on the... Uh... Keep your eye on my right hand as I play a little Fisher's Hornpipe. I don't know if this is how I taught it. It's been a long time. Fisher's Hornpipe. Um, that's a good one. If people play that, you can put like you can put more space in there. Play around with it, and you know, see what see what sounds good to you. Denise has a great question. When you improvise way off the melody, which I was doing a little bit in Fisher's Hornpipe there, ah, uh, uh, Whiskey Before Breakfast there, uh, do you have the melody running in your head? That's a good question. I definitely have the chord progression running. I would say I have the melody running in my head. I know where I am in the tune most of the time. Definitely if I don't know 
Whiskey Before Breakfast I've been playing for 20 years, so that one I, is very hard for me to get lost in. I can get pretty off the rails and still have a sense of where I am. Yeah, part of it has to do with how familiar with the tune you are. Um, but yeah, in, in the perfect world, I've got, you know, the chord progression and some idea of the melody running in my head. So this is kind of, this is part of what's going on in my head. And I've also got and I'm kind of using the chord my understanding of what's going on with the chord progression and my understanding of what's going on with the melody to really allow my fingers and my brain and my muscle memory and kind of understanding of improvisation to I'm kind of like push, pushing the envelope a little bit for myself. You know, everybody's at a different place with improvisation. You know, improvisation is as much going really off the rails and way out um, as it is melodic variation where you just change a note here and there. They're both great. Um, I tend towards the former and sort of keep the melody hearable in my playing most of the time. But then, you know, you hear things like when I play with Noah Fishman, that's when we kind of, I kind of push my own bubble a little bit. Lessons with Marcel. Hey, good to have you here. Definitely check out Lessons with Marcel. Great inst YouTube instructor. Um, says, learn me why my chops sound weak. I will do my best. I'm going to pick up a mandolin that is, when we're talking about like four string chop chords, I don't need to be playing a crazy instrument. So, regular old mandolin. Um... I'd say there's a, a couple things. Let me, I'll just play some chops and see what happens. thoughts about um everybody i'll start out by saying everybody plays chops different um my personal thing is i have a fair amount one thing one of the variables you can play with is like how much note value you have in in the chop in the sound so you, you can have everything from like almost you know, there's a lot of chord ringing out there um but you can all, people will also play like, which is almost purely percussive. There's just like a little hint of chord in there. So play with that variable. Um, another thing that can make chop chords sound, not necessarily we, I, it's, I don't know exactly kind of where you're coming from on the weak thing. Um, I think Something that can give more weight and like gravity to a chop chord is to focus mostly on the lower strings. So when I play a chop chord, I've got this shape under my fingers, the, the classic, you know, the bluegrass chop shape, but I'm pretty much just hitting these two sets of strings, G and D. You know, it's not gonna sound that much different if I play Or if I just play like kind of two finger double stop. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, but you know, I'm if I play the higher strings, it, and some, again, this is all personal preference. Uh, it just gives it a little more sparkle, which can, you know, it can add sparkle, but it can also add treble that kind of takes away from the kind of foundation of the chop chord. So I think those are kind of the, two of the biggest things. You can also play around with like where your right hand is. So if you're playing down here, like right next to the bridge. So 
It's going to make it a little more... I don't know what to call it. A little like thinner maybe versus playing way up over the fingerboard. A little more kind of tubey sounding and a little a little warmer but also a little weird when you get way up over. But finding that sweet spot which again is personal preference and kind of instrument specific. For me it's right around here and I'll, I'll I definitely play around. I'll put, pick anywhere from like here to here depending on what sound I want. You know, so if I really, I'll just stay on an A chord here. So this is like my lushest chop chord. And then you can really, just by moving back a little bit, you get a little more kind of gravel. This is all very wordy, but same sort of thing with like, you know, if you're playing. Both are great sounds. Play around just kind of with your right hand and see where you're at with that. Hope that's helpful. I think that's kind of all I can think about with chop. And I guess maybe the, the only other thing I can think of is like really narrowing in, playing chop chords nice and slow so you really dial in your right and left hand coordination. So an exercise I usually start with teaching people to play chop chords. Is like once you get the shape down, like let it play out and then just release your finger pressure. Or and then kind of speed that up. So you gotta play around with like playing it too slow. So it doesn't it doesn't have the percussion of chop chords and then playing it so fast that you don't get any note value. Hit both of those extremes and then find the sweet spot in the middle for you. Great question. Can't get the swing of my eighth notes without over-exaggerating, especially faster. Any suggestions? I would say just keep going. It might sound more exaggerated to you than you think. Like, I play with a fair amount of swing. Or play along with recordings of people whose swing you like. Like, you listen to Tim O'Brien, and he has so much swing in his playing. It's not really like jazz swing. It's a very kind of folk, bluegrassy, traditional music-y swing. That's also just kind of the Tim O'Brien swing. I love Tim O'Brien. He's a huge influence on my playing, and probably I'm just trying to swing like Tim. Um... people you like to hear and like learn some of their stuff and really slow them down you know put put your favorite picker at like 50% speed and listen and it's gonna sound even more swung slow than it is fast um, you really start to hear all those intricacies when you slow people way down using software um, and yet yeah, you know listen a lot there was one other thing I was gonna say Oh, and record yourself. Um, so you really, it's hard to know what you sound like when you're playing because you're just in a very different headspace from like creating the sound yourself than you are from playing um, or than listening like to a recording. So record yourself and listen back if you aren't already. Opinion on armrests. Um, I use armrests for the most part, but not on every instrument. Um, I just got in the habit because I had an instrument that had a really sharp sides and it was a little like physically uncomfortable. So I kind of got in the habit and I do like where they kind of set your arm up. They give you a place to be every time. They set my hand up a little bit more just to be right in the spot that I like it to be. That said, I don't think it's a necessity by any means, you know. Look at all the amazing mandolin players that don't use armrests. Um, so, you know, try it out and see if you like it. If not, 
no, no big thing one way or the other. Do I know any Turkish or Italian music? I do not. I wish I did. Um, that stuff's great. Tom says, um, seen many tunes from English sitern type instruments. I have a, I mean, this is technically an English sitern. Sitern is kind of a interesting combination of words, but this is a five course um, kind of bazooki made by an English dude. <laughs> um, but there's also like kind of Renaissance sitern, which is a totally different thing. But this is set up kind of like a bazooki. Woo! kind of back Irish music musicians on this thing but um, I don't know a whole lot about like true Renaissance sitern instruments how often in a given song are you just hammering on a note versus striking it with your pick um, I would say 95% of the time I'm striking with a pick I don't do a whole lot of hammer-ons and pull-offs occasionally but for the most part I like to Every note gets its own pick stroke. Jen asked, did you push the envelope with Noah in Polska from Morka? Um, yeah. I, I, most, most tracks, and I mean, everybody's envelope is different. Noah is an incredible musician who, to, like to my ears, pushes the envelope on the regular m more than I do myself. And that's what I love about playing with Noah. Um, he really knows how to, he, he, he's much more versed in like jazz and other kinds of music. I mostly just play fiddle tunes. So my idea of pushing the envelope is like, oh, I'm going to play a little jazzy or a little kind of experimental on this fiddle tune. But that's a very different thing from really being like immersed in the, in the jazz tradition or other styles of music. So pushing the envelope is kind of a little variable depending on what your personal envelope is but uh yeah i there's definitely a lot of weird stuff or weird uh kind of to me out there stuff happening on our album <laughs> i picked up on the subtle art of the muted chop for when you get lost in the tune from a friend of mine yeah it's definitely like oh yeah where are we Oh yeah, there we are. <laughs> and then you get back into it. That's a, a time-honored tradition. Irish songs are very similar to each other. That is true. Um, I'm kind of in a constant state with Irish tunes of saying like, man, all Irish tunes sound the same. And then I'll like play a bunch of Irish tunes for a while and be like, oh no, they're actually all different. And like, you can really tell them apart. And then I play for a couple more months and I'm like, wow, actually no, they're all just borrowing phrases from each other and I can't keep them apart. Then I play for a couple more months, and I'm like, oh, no, they are totally different, and I can keep them apart. It's kind of a cycle that I'm caught in. Ooh, hints of chords in chopping. Is that referred to as dry? I would, I would use that phrase, yeah. Like a drier sort of, you know, it doesn't have as much uh, note value to it. Note value. Um, I would, I'd say that's a good, I don't know, I, I probably have used that descriptor in the past, but uh, I would I, I would know what someone was talking about if they said like a dryer chop chord, that's what I would take it to mean. <laughs> he made a giraffe, yeah. <laughs> it is definitely, uh, it's got a neck to it. Yeah, so playing faster, you know, it's definitely, um, it's definitely a, uh, a lifelong pursuit. I'm always in the, I'm not the fastest player out there by any means. I get kind of out sped regularly, um, but I'm always in a, in a little bit of a, a quest to play faster without, you know, tensing up or playing sloppier 
um, at any given time. So definitely keep at it. You know, play with the metronome. You can keep track of what like beats per minute you can play a tune at if you want to kind of keep some notes for yourself. Um, and that's yeah, it's definitely a, a quest worthy of working on. Let's play, um, got about, so somebody actually just asked, what's your live stream schedule? Most Saturdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the U.S. Um, I know it's a little funky. Somebody also just said they just got here. Um, I know that there's been a couple weeks of daylight savings mishaps if you're across the pond. Um, but, uh, yeah, so generally Saturday, most Saturdays at 1, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the U.S. is when I will be here. And I try to set up the stream so it's a, a day in advance it says that I'm going to be doing one. Let's play, it's about the end of the hour, so let's play a little bit of Behind the Haystack, the tune I started with. Um, we'll do it as a little play-along jam, so we'll pass it back and forth. I'll play the melody, you play the chords, I'll play the chords, you play the melody etc etc um, and have fun with it so the way these work is just that I'll play the melody you play the chords I'll play the chords you play the melody maybe you don't know behind the haystack at all it's an Irish jig in the key of D I'll give you that much it's also got three parts um, but if you don't know the tune at all just see if you can pick up a little bit of it as we go along um, there is also sheet music over at my website if you search behind the haystack but um yeah i totally lost my train of thought <laughs> um welcome to the live stream oh yeah so if you don't know the tune see what you can pick up if you do know the tune but yeah you know you're new to the tune maybe you knew we were doing it from last week um then see if you can uh Really just kind of keep it going, get it under your fingers, work on the little bits that are giving you trouble. Maybe you've been playing uh, behind the haystack for years. At that point, uh, work on whatever you want to do, you know? Try to throw in some melodic variation or some ornaments. Just try to challenge yourself wherever you're at with it. I won't play it too fast, and if it's too fast or too slow, uh, once this video renders and it's back up on YouTube to watch later. You can always use the little gear icon in the bottom right hand corner and speed up or slow down the speed to dial it in to wherever you feel comfortable. Let's do it about here. So key of D. I'll start with the melody, you play chords, swap it back and forth. A part. I'll 
teken. Haystack. Great tune. Let's pick another tune, maybe an old time tune for next week. Have we done Hollow Poplar? That's a question. I think I bet we have. I'm going to look in the little sheet that I've got of what play alongs we've done, but if you have a request, by all means throw it out there. That is not the right one. Play along jams. If we've done Hollow Poplar, if we haven't done Hollow Poplar, we should totally do it. Uh, we did. Uh, I did it as a website play along jam. Let's do Hollow Poplar. Um, that's a great tune. Somebody reminded me of it the other day. Another great request. James says, Newt Pains. I can't honestly remember how that tune goes. It's been years since I've played that tune, but. Uh... <laughs> I, I, gotta, I gotta study up on that one because that's a great tune that I haven't thought about. It's like right on the tip of my tongue, but I gotta practice that one before we, we get to it. So let's do Hollow Poplar next week and then Newt Pains down the line because I do want to remember that tune. Thank you all so much.
for tuning in this week. Thank you all for the super chat donations and the Patreon and the well, however you choose to support me is totally appreciated. Thank you so much. Not required by any means, but also if you need to like get a t-shirt or something, I got merch as well. So no pressure, but thanks for all for tuning in. Hope to see you next weekend. Uh, Reminder to patrons, I do a Patreon-only live stream, and that is happening tomorrow. So all you patrons out there or future patrons, anyone that supports me at $5 a month or more gets access to patron-only live streams. They happen pretty much like this, but uh, just a little more chill because I have more time to actually go in-depth on questions rather than trying to keep up with the chat. Nice. David reminds us that uh, there's Irish and Scottish Gaelic on Duolingo. That's very cool. I should get into that. Uh, advice to get the pinky more involved? I would say uh, look up on my website FFCP. Stands for Four Finger Closed Position Scales. Um, that'll get your pinky going. Thank you all so much. Have a great weekend. See you patrons tomorrow and see... Everybody else, next week on next week's live stream. Happy spring. Happy daylight savings time. Bye-bye.